At this time, I'd like to call the Garden Grove City Council meeting to order. Madam Clerk, would you please call roll? Councilmember Beard? Here. Councilmember Broadwater? Here. Councilmember Jones? Here. Mayor Pro Tem Wynn? Here. Mayor Dalton? Here. Okay, at this time, we'll have the invocation by Susan Emery, Community De Development Director, and the Pledge of Allegiance by uh, Councilman Jones. At the conclusion of the invocation, there will be a moment of silence to recognize the 9-11 tragedy this evening. O oh, great and gracious God, be with us this evening as we remember those whose lives were lost 11 years ago today and for their families and loved ones who suffer still. Also, we remember our, pr our pride in those who stood by their posts in a time of trial. May our words and deeds here reflect our partnership with all who continue to strive for peace and dignity for both humanity and your creation. Amen. 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 I'd like to leave us on the flag, but before I do, I feel compelled to say a few words myself. Um, Eleven years ago today, this country faced a very horrific uh, series of events. I'm sure every one of us remember where we were and what was happening at the time we first saw it. Um, all of us probably watched with disbelief at what we saw in front of our uh, eyes. Um, terrible tragedy, and yet um, 11 years later, looking back, some positives uh, also in the sense that this country faced uh, some of its darkest fears straight in the face and uh, stood together and stood firm to uh, go um, take those problems head on and, and stand strong together. So um, tremendous victory despite a terrible set of events in our history books. Um, please face the flag and say the pledge with me. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Can I see we have a presentation? Yes, Mr. Mayor, and I'd like uh, Susan Emery to make the presentation this evening. Good evening, Mr. Mayor and members of the Council. Tonight, the Garden Grove City Council is pleased to recognize two individuals who have enhanced our community with their generosity, passion, and spirit of service. As the Garden Grove Chamber of Commerce 106 Man and Woman of the Year, they join a long list of individuals who have earned honor and distinction due to their numerous hours of community contributions. I'd like to ask Evie Schildhart and Jerry Newkirk to please come forward. In a long-standing tradition, the Garden Grove Chamber of Commerce recently honored these two individuals with the distinction of being named the 2012 Man and Women of the Year. As a longtime resident and passionate supporter of volunteerism in the community, Evie Shield Hart possesses an extensive list of volunteer recognition. Throughout the years, Evie has lent her valuable assistance to organizations such as the Women's Civic Association, the Garden Grove Unified School District, the Garden Grove Sister City Association, the Girl Scouts, and the Garden Grove Elks Emblem Club, just to name a few. And thankfully for the community of Garden Grove, her list continues to grow. A leader by example is how Jerry Newkirk has been described, both in his professional and personal calling. His management career at Boeing shows the quality and dedication of his leadership commitment to American industry. That same quality and dedication applies to his leadership commitment to volunteer excellence. From his initial involvement in his children's schools, Barker, Bell, and Pacifica, to his guiding membership with the Kiwanis Club, Kiwanis Land, the Boys and Girls Club, the Strawberry Festival Association, Jerry stands out among Garden Grove's volunteers. He's truly both a leader and an example in this community who will continue to inspire many others. The City of Garden Grove expresses profound appreciation to these outstanding honorees for their invaluable efforts and unsurpassed spirit of community. Tonight, the City honors you both as exceptional role models in the community. 
At this time, the mayor and the city council would like to present you each with a certificate of recognition and a memento of our thanks for being such prime examples of commitment and service. Thank you. Good, Mary, or you need one more? I'm fine. Okay. Okay, now please say a few words. Thank you. I would just like to thank all the organizations I've been involved with because if it wouldn't be for them, I wouldn't have all the wonderful memories that I have right now including tonight, this evening. This is the icing on the cake. Thank you. Thank you. I would just like to say thank you to the mayor and the council for this honor. Uh, like Evie says, I'd like to thank the organizations that allow me to serve the community through them, the Kiwanis, Kiwanis Land, the Boys and Girls Club, and the Strawberry Festival. Uh, it's a great honor. I enjoy living in Garden Grove and serving the community. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, at this time, I'll open our communications for the council's successor agency. Peggy Bergen. Well, today you all can rest easy. I have not one comment to make about Garden Grove because I have a topic that I'm sure will take up more than the five minutes that I am allotted. Today is, um, as we all know, the anniversary of a devastating event in our lives. And um, it's also an anniversary on the 26th of this month, which is Mesothelioma Awareness Day, which also has quite a connection to 9-11, because all of those lovely photos we saw on TV for the better part of a month of those horrible buildings collapsing and turning into just dust, most people were told that was cement. No, it was not. The majority of that floating dust was asbestos, which is a fatal, to some people, disease-causing mineral element, I don't know exactly what it is myself. Nobody really does, other than it is, it is a rock in the ground. That is very effective use of insulation. And one and a half of the towers, every single piece of metal in those buildings had sprayed on asbestos. So the pipes, the metal beams would be uh, insulated. So when those buildings crumbled into dust, that was released. And asbestos has an eight-day floating in the air, every single particle. And to give you an idea of how small asbestos is, you do not see individual particles. If you look at a penny, which we all have in our pockets and purses, and you look under Lincoln's beard, and you see the initial of which mint it was minted on, that initial could hold 20,000 strands of asbestos. So there is no way you can see an individual particle. Now asbestos and mesothelioma are very highly integrated. I know that from now a six, six and a half years of 
lots of study and research on my part because my husband happened to die of mesothelioma six years ago this in October. And as it turns out, his operation that was going to buy him a few more extra years turned out to be on September 26th, which the following year, um, the Mesothelioma Foundation started a push to make that day awareness day, make people aware, not only for that one specific disease that is caused by an outside influence, it's for any industrial or work-related diseases that are caused by what we work with. You know, most of us don't realize when you go to work, just like those poor people in the Twin Towers, very few of them that were rushing to work that morning ever thought they would never have another dinner. They thought, another day at work, what a bummer, oh my God, I'm not paid enough, I'm going to be late, all the things we all think of, and they never ever went home. Their families are still suffering from the injustice of that. Mesothelioma is a disease that affects people that work with asbestos. The asbestos goes in their body, they breathe it in, and for some unforeseen reason, those little tiny perforations or holes in the lungs that gets into the cavity between your lungs. And it's not a disease in the lungs, it's of the cavity. Those little particles get in there just like a piece of sand in the end of your bed at night and rub and rub and rub. And your skin on both sides, the pleura, decides it's going to protect itself and it makes a little hard nodule. And that little hard nodule for years stays there and it gets bigger and bigger and bigger and it breaks off and lands someplace else and starts all over again. And in the space of anywhere from five to 50 years, you will end up, you can end up with a very fatal disease. My husband's disease was diagnosed this way. Yes, we have unfortunately found out what you have. It's mesothelioma. Slightly treatable, uncurable, fatal. That was the exact wording the doctor gave us. Not very hopeful. And there's very few treatments for it. And that's why research, education, and all of that is so important in all of these work-related diseases. Mine, of the one I speak of, is mesothelioma, which on the 26th of this month is Mesothelioma Awareness Day. And I can almost guarantee if any of you look in your memory banks, you have heard of somebody you know that has passed away or they know somebody that has passed away from this disease. It's a very bad disease. Once you get it, it's fatal. And as my shirt will say, mesothelioma, hard to say, hard to understand, hard to treat. There are two operations, one of which is worse than the other, and one type of cancer treating uh, uh, chemotherapy. Other than that, they tell you, go home, take a trip, make a will. So think of that whenever you, you think of insulation again. I did leave some of these with Kathy for you to look at, and there is a, a number on the back. If you, any of you go to breathing doctors having to do with asthma and that, please, please give them that information so they might get in touch with this group and find out some more information themselves so they will know the questions to ask patients. Thank you very much. Thank you, Peggy. Alma Valdez. Good evening. I'm here to let you know uh, that it's a big problem right in front of my business. I have a business at 105 Fortucatella. It's a beauty salon. And people, they come and park cars for sale. Um, and they're, they're not one or two cars. They're like six, seven, eight cars. And it's unsafe because when people come and look at the cars, they're families with children. They leave the children unattended, and they go and look for the cars. Uh, the other thing they do, they, they double park. And when people, they want to go through, it's no way they can go through because they block the parkway. It's a parkway between Catella and our business. And for 10 years, we've been suffering with that. I've been calling code enforcement, and they say that nothing they can do about it because 
they don't have an ordinance. They can just go and check, and after three days, they can do something, but so far they haven't done anything. Uh, and I'm here to ask you if it's any way uh, they can put like a two hours parking, maybe that would help. The other thing is they park very close to the curb. When people, they go south on, on the parkway, and you would try to make a turn on Catella, there's no way you can see the traffic coming is because all the cars that park there. It's, it is very dangerous, very, very dangerous. And that's what I'm here to let you know and see. If okay, we we'll have somebody look at it, it and they'll get back to you within a week, okay? Okay, we have pictures here. I'm sorry? I what? have pictures. Uh, I have you evidence. Can them with the city clerk. And I would like, I appreciate if you... Each one of you can see it. Okay, if you give them to the city Thank clerk. You. Okay, Robin Macario. Uh, good evening, Council, Mayor, staff, and Garden Grove residents. I'm uh, Robin Macario, a 50-year resident in our great city. Um, I just wanted to add to Steve and Susan's comments um, with regards to, to the memorial for today, for sep uh, September 11th, just to uh, to add to their comments to also honor those that um, that have fought for our freedoms, uh, past and present. I just wanted to add that quick comment. Um, I also want to um, kind of put out a, a good word for our public works. Um, they're responsible for the pipes below and the streets above and all the public buildings and public areas uh, in between. And um, I traveled around uh, the parks today. There seem to be in droves. All the parks look absolutely fabulous. I just am so proud of our public works people. And um, I made one phone call um, about three weeks ago. There was a, a series of curbs in the front of Ralston Intermediate. Uh, the, the curbs had raised, and it was like about three weeks before school started. And I said, you know, if I know you're busy. I know you have thousands of curbs to, to address. But they squeezed it in and did a, a fabulous job of making it safe for our children. Um, I also um, am pleased to read in the uh, Garden Grove Journal that uh, the Garden Grove Galleria, the first mixed-use building on Garden Grove Boulevard right near uh, Brookhurst, um, there was a lawsuit between the Galleria and the bank. The bank thought it would be a good idea mid-term through the middle of the loan to stop stop paying. And so they have prevailed in that, that, that suit, and I'm pleased and look forward to seeing uh, that um, moving forward. Um, the last... Um, the thing I want to address is um, up and coming, uh, the OCTA board will be choosing the um, 405 improvement decision, and our representatives um, on that board are Supervisor Janet Wynn and Mayor Dalton. Uh, the council has appointed Dalton to represent us on that board, and essentially there are three options with regards to what improvements our Measure M monies will be spent on. That's the gas tax that we all decided would be a good idea to extend to improve public transportation, the roads, improve the 405 freeway. So at this time, the decision is to choose which option would be best. Um, the first option is to add one general purpose lane. That's a lane that we all use on the freeway. The second option is to add two additional lanes for general purpose, and both the first and second maintain the carpool lane and allow for continuous access. So you can enter and exit the carpool lane such as we have on the 22 freeway. So those two options seem uh, to meet the requirements and certainly have the best public benefit for all of us that have contributed to the Measure M gas tax. The last option is to take our carpool lane and make it a general purpose lane and then create two toll roads, two toll lanes, which um, doesn't make a lot of sense to me at all. And um, Mayor, I know you're good about getting out of the community and talking to people and 
I don't you know, especially the west side, they're going to be putting up with construction for a couple of years, and they would like to see two general purpose lanes that everybody gets to use, as well as the maintaining of our carpool lane. Um, anybody I've talked to in the community thinks that toll roads are a bad, bad choice, and that's not what we use to uh, approve Measure M. We wanted the public benefit for everyone, not exclusive toll loans, but inclusive general purpose lanes for everyone to use. So I look forward, uh, Mayor Dalton, I'm sure you'll represent us in a positive way and improve the, the 405 freeway with the two additional general purpose lanes. I have faith in you. This is an important decision. On the eve of you leaving office, you have the chance to really step up and doing the right thing. Thanks very much. Thank you. Lucille Crane. Good evening, Mayor and City Council members. I'm here to speak on the same item that Alma Valdez spoke about. I've been going to Alma's shop for over 10 years, and the 10 years that she's been in this location. And over those 10 years, the problem has gotten worse. There are cars that double park. There are cars for sale. And another thing that wasn't discussed, these cars, it's not just you and me putting a sign on our car that we're selling our car to the public and we're running around and parking and that's okay. But these cars, they're actually, they're our business. People have a small little shop and then they have no place to park their cars, so they put them on commercial properties, they put them in your residential neighborhoods. They are a business. So they are actually taking money away from the brick and mortars that support your city, support Anaheim, support all other cities. So they are really doing all of us a disfavor. So I would appreciate it if you would look into this, provide some type of an ordinance, perhaps no parking on certain days or at certain times when her business is in is doing business. And she has a storefront in the, in the front of her building that she's been trying to rent out. And a couple of people have come to inquire about using that for their business. But when they see the type of, of traffic that's outside and the enormous amounts of cars for sale, they say, sorry, this is not the kind of place that I feel my business would be able to survive. So it, she has really been very much impacted. She's the one talking tonight, but you will see letters from every business in that small little quadrant, and they all have been impacted by this. And their businesses are losing customers just because these people do not want to provide a brick and mortar for the sale of their cars. So thank you very much and appreciate anything that you can do. Thank you. Raymond Choi. Good evening, Honorable Mayor and Councilman and the city staffs. My name is Raymond Choi. I'm the chairman of a Korean Festival Foundation of Orange County, and formerly I'm a president of a Korean Chamber of Commerce of the Orange County. On behalf of a Korean Festival Foundation of Orange County, I'd like to thank you to the city of Garden Grove to supporting Korean Festival of Orange County last 28 years. Without your support and your help, we cannot be here tonight. And tonight, uh, the Festival Foundation are requesting uh, you know, reduce the deposit to City of Garden Grove, which is $7,500. And we were requesting the same contract that they have last year, extended one more year. So we, we, we're going to bring up the more deposit to the City of Garden Grove. So it, it is very important for us as a Korean American community and the city of Garden Grove is very important to us. So making it this, this city at the center of the Korean American community in Orange County. Once again, in a foundation, Korean Festival Foundation, looking forward to your continuous support, making our festival so very successful over this year. Once again, thank you so much for your time and, and listening to me. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Josh McIntosh. Uh, again, here is the, uh, we have a program book and uh, 
really a kit for the, for the dish here. So just, just give us her. She'll pass them around. Thank you, Ram. Thanks. Okay. Good evening, Mayor, City Council members, City staff, and the good people of Garden Grove. My name is Josh McIntosh. I'll remind you that I'm a fourth generation Garden Grove resident, Argonaut, homeowner, small business owner, as well as a candidate for the 2012 city elections this year. <clears throat> I just left another meeting this evening across the street at the Garden Grove High School. We were discussing the budget over there and how the, the teachers are 33 to 1 students being uh, 33 teachers one and uh, addressing some of their issues that are pressing the education here and uh, that's just one of the many organizations in our city where I volunteer my time and services to I also like to thank the other volunteers that were acknowledged tonight for their services in the city they're truly the people that make this a great place well volunteering in Garden Grove is very important to me and uh, pretty much because I grew up here, I enjoy giving back to the city that raised me, that raised my family, and most of my friends. I know that the people whom I work alongside with also feel the same way. We all want to make Garden Grove a better place to live and work in. We're not being paid for our time. We're not out there to get in front of a camera or to have a nice little write-up in our local newspaper. We just volunteer because it's the right thing to do. It's not about benefiting ourselves. It's about benefiting our community. This love for our community is one of the reasons why I've chosen to run for city council. I'd like to believe that the elected officials and city employees here share the same belief with me. I'd like to believe that we have the best people working for us that are not just here to pick up a check and then drive home to their hometown, perhaps in a vehicle that was paid for and the insurance paid for by the people of Garden Grove. Last council meeting, I stood before you and addressed my concerns regarding Mr. Fertel's uh, salary at $21,261 every month. This is the same city manager who's telling us we're in a grim financial state and we have no more options. City manager is not the only person who's making what I consider an obscene amount of money every month from a city who he claims is in a grim financial state. We have many top-level administrative employees making nearly double the amount of money paid to people in the private sector for similar work duties. This information is available on the city webpage, and I encourage everyone to read it. Sadly, our city management is often quick to look to our educators, police, and fire departments as the first people to make cutbacks on for the workforce or add to their duties. Well, I don't think that our police force, firemen, and educators working with the bare minimum of staff deserve to be taking these cuts. I'd like to see the entire top tier of our city managers, directors, supervisors take an immediate 15% pay cut. This is a realistic deduction for the people whom we've been paying anywhere from $10,000 to $21,261 every month for administrative duties in an air-conditioned office. These are not our local heroes, our first responders who are placing themselves in harm's way or teaching our children. These are people who are living quite well and enjoying a comfortable lifestyle from the people in Garden Grove who are paying for this. We've got a lot of people in this city who are struggling to put food on their table, pay their rent or their mortgages, or gas in their tanks. It is common knowledge that a job within the city or county provides a generous paycheck, benefits, and retirement package. I'm asking you first, Mr. Fertel, to voluntarily take a 15% pay cut, lead by example to the rest of your staff as well. I believe working for the city of Garden Grove should not be about what you can get out of it. You shouldn't be here to benefit your own personal agenda, whether it's to take home an enormous salary or provide favors to the people who donate to your campaigns, or even worse, to give contracts to people on this board. If you're not involved for the benefit of the city of Garden Grove, I don't think you belong here. Finally, I want to address Mr. Broadwater's statement from the ending of our last council meeting. Mr. Broadwater, after being presented with the concerns of our residents, 
in regards to the contracts made between the city and the water park developers. You stated that you were ashamed of us for not agreeing with you for giving $47 million up front and free land to a wealthy development company. Well, I didn't appreciate your tone, your choice of words. I don't think that those are the type that a representative should be making. There are only a few residents that show up to these Gosh, meetings. I'm going to wrap it up because your time's out, okay? I apologize. That's okay. I'll give you a little bit, but wrap it up, please. There are only a few residents that care enough to show up to these council meetings and speak out what are important issues to us. We don't deserve to be scolded like children. We deserve representatives, real representatives of the people. My name is Josh McIntosh, and I hope to become an elected councilman this year. Thank you. <laughs> Helen Smith. I haven't talked to Mike for so long. I forget how. Take your time. Uh, your life. City council members, I, my name is Helen Smith, and uh, I encountered a problem which I think should be looked into. I've lived in Garden Grove at 11852 West Street since 71, and uh, uh, I've always understood that they were to be single-family dwellings. Well, while I'm walking around in the cul-de-sacs in the neighborhood, I see cars galore. They're parked all over. And one person in particular, the address is uh, 11811 Debbie Lane. She's an Oriental lady. Her, all, all I know is that her name is uh, Moon. And uh, she rents her whole house out. She's got four bedrooms. She rents out all the bedrooms individually. And she herself sleeps on the couch in the front room. And she's also got a mobile home in the driveway, which she rents out too. Well, that is very unfair to the rest of the residents in that area, and I'm sure she isn't the only person in that, in those cul-de-sacs that does this because of all the parking, like I say, you can't walk down the street when you're walking. You have to walk around the cars because they're even parked on the uh, uh, lawns, and uh, I don't think it's right or fair. So if the city is not going to do anything and correct all these errors that are there, I'm going to start renting out every room I've got. I can use the money too. And uh, I'm a widow, I'm retired, so I can share my home. So if that's the way you want to run the city, then fine. I'll live the rest of my life out by renting out rooms. Okay, thank you. Um, I will have somebody get a hold of you within a week, okay? Already. Already. I'm sorry, what? Within a week. I said, fine, thank you. Okay, uh. all right. Rod Powell. Hi, my name is Rod Powell. I am a Garden Grove resident. Just a thought, um, for a circumstance like that, you might consider, uh, my mom's house is over near, near that area, only it's in Anaheim, and they all have to, in order to park on the street now, where I grew up, you have to have parking permits. So it's just a thought, if you, you know, instead of having all those cars on the street, one house, and have a limit of, you know, how many parking permits per house. You know, it's just and in, in, in enforce not letting people park on the grass. I know that's a, a code violation. So there are some things you could that can can be done. Um, I was going to talk about. Uh, I read an article. I got online today looking at some of the things about medical marijuana. I looked at some of the. I I, I got online looking at some of the reasons people, def, you know, put down our city, call it Garbage Grove. You know, just I was trying to get an idea. I didn't know what I wanted to say tonight. And I, I, I don't like that people feel that way about us. 
you know, and I started wondering if it's because we're one of the few cities that has fireworks, if it's because we don't enforce our code enforcement like we ought to, uh, if it's because now we're the one of two cities at, at the time of that article last year that had uh, gone against banning uh, and decided to regulate. We made we made the medical marijuana or, or, the, or the marijuana advocacy group, you know, uh, champion list. Um, and Dina, you were quoted, uh, Mr. Fertal, if that's the correct pronunciation. You were quoted. Uh, you guys are heroes now. To the medical to the marijuana advocates, not medical marijuana per se, they're saying this is just a beginning. Next thing you know, why don't we legalize marijuana? Uh, it just went on and on and on. It made us look uh, like idiots, as we appear to be for our stance on marijuana. We appear weak um, and and not too bright. Um, so I was going to talk a little about that, but that's enough. I don't. I just want to remind. Uh, the citizens that watch this show that we have a problem in this city with too many dispensaries. I drive down Brookhurst almost every day, uh, pass by Orangewood almost every day. I notice over there uh, where there's a haircut shop, which I wanted to buy 20 years ago, or, or rent or whatever, lease, and it, it, it wasn't a haircut shop then. I, that was my idea, and, um, and someone else had the same idea. And so I always look over there thinking, you know, I should have. And now that's where that uh, Unit B, one of the original f famous medical marijuana dispensaries of Garden Grove, now they got a big sign out there, that, that, uh, that emblem that indicates that you have marijuana at 2 in the morning because you might need it at 2 in the morning. If you're jonesing for a joint, you know, most of the people doing medical marijuana are abusing it. They've got articles online on how step-by-step step, to find easy doctors, the medical marijuana doctors, go in there and give them about $25 and, um, or whatever it is. It's not very hard to get a card. Uh, I, I've talked to several people in uh, houses that I run that, that have a real understanding of how easy it is to abuse uh, the system by getting those cards for recreational use. Um, you know, it's hard for me to look at council members on this council that were originally appointed, and, you know, there's a problem with the way that we conduct things in this city. You know, uh, now we're going to have you on, Mayor, uh, it's going to be Broadwater probably as mayor. I mean, it's, and then, then, then we have, again, you'll be picking someone. I hope that we'll be responsible in who we pick um, for, the, for the person coming in. Um, because there's going to be another seat open very soon. Um, Tony Flores used to come down to this place, and he's always talking about districts. It's very unusual for a city of our size not to be having districts. Why don't we? What is the problem with simply putting that on a, on, the, on a, one of the one of the ballots at election time? Why don't you let the citizens decide if we can have districts? There's no representation in the majority of this city. I'd be willing to bet that some of our council members have rarely, if at all, been at some of the zip codes in our city. So that's not representation. Uh, the only way we're ever going to have that in the city is to go with districts. That's uh, a conclusion that I, I've come up with. Uh, is that asking too much to consider putting that uh, as, as a ballot measure? It's not very difficult to do. You just do it. Thank you. Thank you. This time I'll close oral communications. Anyone want to make comments at this time or later? Okay. I will um, recess the council meeting and we'll go to the successor agency. Thank you, Mayor. I'll call the uh, successor agency meeting to order. Madam, Ch Madam Clerk, can you please call roll? Member, <clears throat> Member Broadwater? Here. Member Dalton? Here. Member Wynn? Here. Vice Chair Beard? Here. Chair Jones? Here. Uh, we already did uh, oral communications in conjunction with City Council um, consent items, just the warrant. Move the consent items. Second that. Call the vote. Motion received, five yes votes. Uh, we have uh, no public hearings and no items. Do we have any members, uh, matters from agency members? Seeing none, we are adjourned. Thanks.
Okay, we'll go to uh, consent. We'll reconvene the council, let the record show all members are present, and go to consent items. Mr. Mayor, it's recommended items 4A through 4G be acted on simultaneously unless a separate discussion is requested. Oh, 4G, will you for it, please? G, no, excuse me, 4F, I'm sorry. G. Okay, I'll entertain a motion on a balance. Move to approve. Second. I have a motion, a second, call for the vote. Motion received, five yes votes. Okay, Mr. Broadwater. Have all the changes and everything for the payment system been uh, uh, put into this? No, they're not included currently. We will bring it here for you to discuss it. And if you want to approve it, then we'll make the alteration to the agreement. We'll make that change. Well, if we go forward with the agreement tonight, does that keep us from making the alterations? No, but we would have to amend. Uh, you'd have to put the language in tonight to amend it to allow them to make those payments. You'd have to make a motion identifying the changes that right. you'd like to make. I'm not sure if the rest of the council knows. So. I don't think so either. Correct. Yeah. Uh, At the time of your meeting, the agenda had already been um, distributed. Are you able to recite the changes for us now? I'd like to bring it back in two weeks. We can do that. I mean, it, it, how soon is, the, is it going to happen? What's the dates for it? It's October 23rd. So October 23rd. Well, we still have a little time. Uh, I mean, there were some changes made, and if we vote on this tonight, I don't see that happening. Well, we could report on the meeting if you'd like us to do that to the rest of the council tonight. You could make the recommendation that we change the agreement to incorporate that language. And if the council agreed, we could make that change in the agreement. Okay. Do we write it down or? We could talk, we could just talk about it verbally and then we can just alter it. It's a small alteration. Okay, why don't you go ahead? Do you want me to take this? Yeah. That? Um, okay, well, um, uh, okay. well, let me just do it. Um, a couple of months ago when we had a study session, we had discussed the idea of the Korean Feder uh, Foundation having their um, annual uh, festival this year, and we were looking to amend their agreement for a one-year period. Uh, they currently um, have fees of $7,500 to the city, and we were looking to increase it by $12,500 to provide for payment of the uh, police support for the parade. That would make their total payment of $20,000. So it does say 20000 in here. It does say a total of $20,000, yes. Um, since the time of that meeting, to be able to get sufficient sponsorship, uh, the Korean uh, Federation has not been able to get that, and they were requesting additional time. One thought is to have them pay $8,000 up front and then a monthly payment of $12,000 over the course of the year, uh, a monthly payment of $1,000, and over the year they would pay the entire $20,000 by the end of next September. And then we would... Um, so if we vote on it tonight, that. it's just a matter of payment then? Correct. Okay. I make a motion. I'll, I'll, I'll move the issue. I'll second that. Okay, I have a motion and a second. Call for the vote. Motion received, five yes votes. Right. Okay, public hearings. Mr. Mayor, your public hearing is a continued item from August 28th having to do with a consideration to request a change of zoning uh, for property located at 12332 Brookhurst from C1 to C2. Uh, before we go any further, um, I understand yes, that... Yes, uh, I have a statement to make. I need to recuse myself from item 5A um, through C. I have clients who have real property interests within the proximity of the property. Okay. Um, interesting enough, one of the reasons it was continued is because we only had four council members at the last uh, council meeting and was thought that it would be best if this matter was heard before all five council members. And then we have since learned that uh, Councilwoman Wynn has a, has a conflict. 
But by way of just sort of background, we'll have uh, Chris Chung just briefly summarize the, uh, the request, and then we can open the public hearing again. Good evening, Mr. Mayor and members of the City Council. Amendment number A-168-12 is a request to rezone the subject properties located at 12332 Brooker Street with assessor's parcel number 089-362-01 and 02 from C1 to C2 to operate an existing restaurant with live entertainment in the form of karaoke one-man band with amplified sound and a stage. And this item was continued from the previous city council held on August 28, 2012. And that will conclude staff's report, and we are here to answer any questions you may have. Any questions for staff? I, I do. Go Susan, ahead. did you find any more information about um, just kind of police activity and stuff in the past or any? Uh, what I heard is that the primary concerns related to some noise complaints from the police department. I don't know if um, Sergeant Leva's here, if he wants to come in and address any additional concerns, but that's what I heard after we had met. Why don't we have him come in? Okay. Yes, Mayor Dalton and members of the City Council. The primary issues that we had at that location were after hours operation and issues relating to entertainment. What, what do you mean by entertainment? They received five administrative citations for being open after the allotted um, hours of operation and for having a disc jockey. And this is when they close, what are their current hours now? Currently, the hours of operation are from 10 a.m. to 11 p.m. Sunday through Thursday and 10 a.m. to 12 a.m. Friday and Saturday. So, so they want to extend uh, Friday and Saturdays two more hours till 2 in the morning. Correct. But yet they've been cited five times for not obeying what time to close currently. And I, Excuse me, Mr. Mayor. I also believe it was related to the entertainment. And so one of the things they're trying to do with the, the zone change conditional use permit is to come into compliance with what they would like to see as new rules. So to change the zone would allow for the entertainment. The C1 zone would not allow for it, but the C2 zone would. So if you made that change, then they would no longer be getting administrative citations for entertainment because they would be permitted to have entertainment in that zone. And then extending the hours would also allow them to be compliant with the way they currently operate. I think that's the reason why the request came in. Okay. Go ahead, Mr. Miller. The uh, in, in changing this zone, I mean, this isn't a PUC, but it it, uh, it seems to me that the illumination of that place when I walk or drive by there every night, it's always really dark in there. Is uh, have we had any problems with that, or we have not had any issues as far as uh, vehicle break-ins or anything related to the lighting? Okay, and did we have anybody talk to us at all about the the noise from the? From the neighbors there? We have had no documented um, calls for service related to loud music. You had a, a, a music there against the rules and you have had no nobody complain about it? Correct. The majority of our administrative citations were self-initiated activity, basically officers on patrol and checking the business. I believe we did receive some letters from residents in the neighborhood when the notices went out concerned that the later hours could potentially impact them we did in have terms of noise. We did have speak last week about it, mm -hmm. two weeks ago. And I had a couple of people call me about it, too. They were concerned. Uh, any other questions for staff before I open the public hearing? Okay, I'll open the public hearing. Is there anyone here that would like to speak on this? Peggy Bergen. Well, basically, for being a um, nine-year follower of the city council on Tuesday nights, I have seen issues like this come and go, and they ba basically have been turned down almost, almost, I'm not saying 100%, but close to 100% 
because of entertainment issues that um, that creates a different sort of clientele that comes in. And then I find it very hard to understand that someone would come before you that already cannot follow their existing rules and want the rules to be changed for them. If you cannot follow the rules as they are now and then just apply for a change of venue, then how can we expect them to follow these rules? Because if they were not supposed to be having entertainment before and they have had incidents with entertainment, now it is allowed, which means they are going to have the allowability until 12 o'clock, uh, 2 o'clock in the morning to make noise. So therefore, there's not going to be any quieter than it is now. It will be noisier. So I just really don't understand from the amount of businesses like this that have been turned down and been told, no, we don't want entertainment. We want, if you're a restaurant, you're a restaurant. If you're a, I don't know for a better term, beer bar, you're a beer bar. But we don't want entertainment. So I, I find this very kind of selective zoning. Now, is this going to mean anybody that's within a mile stretch of this will be able to apply for the same thing? Or is this a very individual application for one specific piece of property? But I, I don't think this is right. And I do not live anywhere near it, so it has nothing to do with me sound-wise, traffic-wise, or anything. I just think uh, my questions are just somewhat general from the way I've seen rulings come down over the years. And some of them were on Main Street, that they were denied um, karaoke because of the, the clientele, according to you, that it brings in. So now this is saying because it's not in a highlighted area, it's fine to do it. So I just find those are a few little questions that I have. So I, I you know, that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Josh McIntosh. Thank you for letting me speak. I don't want to sound like a broken record, but I am going to repeat what I said last uh, pretty much in support of the, I believe, the Chill restaurant. I've never been there, but I'm a disc jockey. I'm an entertainer, and I understand how hard it is to get work in Garden Grove because of all the roadblocks that we have set up against us and our small businesses to allow live entertainment here. <clears throat> I've said this all before, and I'm going to say it again. We are certainly creating roadblocks uh, as far as our restaurants to attract nightlife, and we're sending our dollars to other cities where people can actually be entertained by more than one live performer. I would like to see the move from C1 to C2 zoning made a lot more easily. Um, I understand it's $2,500 to make an amendment to your uh, CUP. I think that's a very expensive cost. It's been termed as an administrative fee. Look me in the eye and tell me it costs two thousand five hundred dollars to change a, to check another box. I understand it has to be put into a newspaper. It doesn't cost two thousand five hundred dollars. Um, I'd like to see it made easier for restaurants to have nightlife here in Garden Grove. I'd certainly like to work at them and have the job opportunity. I'd like to see the revenue stay in our city, people come to our city, and we just need to look at the volume control. If this is all about volume and security, then the, night, the, the restaurants can hire security. They can have a manager that turns down the volume if it gets too loud. It's not that hard to do. I do it all the time. So I'd like this council to please uh, support their change in zoning. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Are you the proponent? Yeah, come on up, sure. But make sure you fill out a card. State your name when you get up here, and make sure you fill out a card. Are you the proponent? Are you the business owner? Um, yes. Okay. Yeah. Come on up. Sure. Right there. Yes. Uh huh. Well, you can fill it out at the end. I uh, I work at the location. Are you the owner? No, I'm not the owner. Okay, what is your capacity? Are you a uh, manager? Manager, okay. Okay, um, I work there, and I believe that it's. Um, I don't understand why um, you can't cannot change and um, let us open until two o'clock. Um, I work there, and I don't see that you know we're making any noise, 
And um, as a sergeant over there, I say that we have five tickets. I've been working there for six months. I don't see any tickets. We have no tickets at all. And um, the music is not loud. Whenever we have the music loud, usually we lower it down. And um, we have security on site. And But, you know, the problem is the cops always come there and, you know, gave us a problem, come in, look around, scare the customer away. And, you know, as for us working, we make tips. And if the cops keep coming in, customer don't come in, you know. How are we going to make tips? I mean, it's city of Westminster let people open to 2, 3 o'clock in the morning, and I don't see why we can't open to 2. And we're only requesting two days a week. Yeah, but it's a weekend, and those are usually the weekend that uh, the nights that you have more people. You know, you're as far as how come the police come in. The police certainly have a right to come in, and they should go in every business. Yeah, they come to in, ensure, but then... No, to ensure that things don't happen, not just to go in to clean up the mess after they've happened. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I'm always, I'll be very honest with you, I'm always worried about any business that said that I don't like the police coming in. No, I mean, we don't mind the police coming in. Every, you know, like, they, they come in, they look around, they stand around, and then they will follow our customer and give them DUI tickets. And then customer, you know, people would not come there anymore. How how you expect a business to open and make money when there's, you know, the cops always chasing the customer for DUI. Are you serving them too much? No, we're not serving then you, them then too much. Then there shouldn't be a problem. Yeah, but, I mean, I don't think it's... Mm -hmm. Well, I think I think there's a... Go ahead, Mr. Browater. You said you work for tips? Yes. Don't we, you we, get paid minimum wage? Yeah, yeah, we got minimum wage plus, plus tips. tips. Yeah, but then, you know, it's money. Mm -hmm. You know, we, we have to support... We have to pay rent and things like that, and that's additional income. I mean, if the business have no, no customer, eventually the owner is going to fire us, and we have no job. Mm -hmm. I mean, city of Westminster lets people open for business until 2 o'clock. Why is it so limited to the city of Garden Grove. You know, sometimes it's easier to look at these things with more of an open mind when people have been complying if the time that they close is an earlier time and they want a later time, if they have a track record of obeying the times and the rules, you know, it's a lot easier to look at it. But then when someone quite often doesn't go along with the rules, there's certainly no indication that if you give them two more hours, they're not going to want two and a half hours. They're not going to want another time for people to drink when it, when they should be closed down. I mean, um, since I I worked there, we've been it's, it's an, under new ownership already, so we never have any tickets or any citation or any problems. I mean, the the previous owner probably did something. I mean, it's them. It's, we're under new management now, and I don't see why because somebody else did something wrong and it goes on to the next person. Okay. Do anyone else have any questions? Well, I have a question related to staff. Has there been any citations in the last six months that you're aware of? No, sir. The citations were from May of 2011 through February of 2012. Yes, so the new ownership was February. I, I, start, I start working there February, end of February. So there's no citation. We always close exactly on time, 12 o'clock, never have any complaints. And I obey. I told the cops, if there's any problem, we will call you guys. I never did anything that's against the law. Okay, any other questions? How long has the new ownership been in place? Um, February. Six months. Do they have any prior experience in running this type of establishment? Um, no. He just hired a manager, so I'm the manager there. Okay, thank you. Would you please fill the card up before you leave, though, so they have it further? Give it to her? Yes. Okay, this time I'll close the public hearing. Gentlemen. Well, I have a question for you, Mayor. You've received comments from neighborhoods, uh, um, uh -huh. from the people in the neighborhood. Is there is there concern about the, the, the potential? Well, there's a concern noise? right now because the, the music, even the music that that is emitting now, it's, it echoes. It's kind of, okay, and that's one of the big problems. And so, you know, where it may be, maybe a little more bearable or tolerable at an earlier hour. You know, people are concerned that, yeah, you go to after midnight, I go to 2 in the morning on a weekend, it's going to be, and I know that the music does 
um, it's kind of almost like a wind tunnel through there, but the, it does echo and mm -hmm. comes down in adjacent streets. It's, it's and it's pretty close to residential. Yeah, it would, and the only thing separating is some flood control channel mm -hmm. right next door. And there's businesses, but that's the main concern of those people right next door mm -hmm. uh, and, to the yeah. north. And around. Mm -hmm. Okay. You know, we have two other businesses in town right now that we just have a noise problem with, and they're constantly getting cited. I hate to see them get cited. It costs them $1,000 every time it happens. Uh, the the one on Main Street that, it, that has been cited for noise, the residential area is a lot further away than it is at the grill. The, the residential is right on top of it at the grill. And, and the same with the can on Euclid Street. I mean, that lady that makes the complaints against the can lives a lot further away from the can than the residents on the other side of the PE right away. I'm, I'm really dubious about this. How's that a motion? Well, if I make a motion to do it, I mean, it's going to be on a short period of time and it bring, comes back to us to see what has happened. I mean, and already they're talking about, I mean, Peggy said that they were uh, going to be open until 2 o'clock. They're not going to be open until 2 o'clock. They're going to be open until 12 o'clock on two nights in the weekend. And uh, and the lady that managed it got up and spoke just a minute ago and said, well, we need 2 o'clock. I mean, so are we going to be hearing from them again instantly, or how's this going to go work? No, I'm not making a motion. Oh, well, I'm in a motion either way. I'm not making a motion either way. Okay. <laughs> hmm. Well, you know what? I'm going to make a motion not to approve the amendment number A16812. Um, excuse me, Mr. Mayor. Well, if, do I have to wait for a second to go ahead and then read the whole If there is going to be a motion, yep. but just to say that uh, staff has pre presented a proposed resolution for your consideration, if in fact it's a uh, motion to deny. So I think that the motion would be to adopt uh, the resolution that was uh, provided to the city council. And then you can see whether there's a second for that. Okay, then I'll make a motion. I might second it. Uh, I would. Uh, if, I would make a substitute. Is there a chance that we could let them have it for 90 days or six months and see what happened? What is before the city council right now is a uh, proposed zone change. Uh, the actual hours of operation were considered at the planning commission meeting in the CUP. That's not actually before the city council this evening. What is before the city council is the proposed change from the C1 zone to the C2 zone. So the hours are actually not something before the city council this evening. So what type of hours do they have under the C-1? Well, they had the previous ones that uh, they were open till, I think, 12 o'clock on uh, Friday and Saturday. It was 11 o'clock during the week. And that's what they've had all along? That's what they had prior to going into Planning Commission. The Planning Commission approved the new hours. Uh, the applicant originally requested for 12:30 um, Sunday through Thursday, but the planning commission approved uh, to to, to maintain the 11 p.m. closing time, and then only Friday and Saturday to be opened till 2 a.m. Till 2 a.m. Right. So that's been approved already at the planning commission. The I'll hours have been approved. I'll second the motion. <clears throat> I'd like uh, second my motion. Yeah. Okay. The only no motion is flying out there. Um. Yeah, I just I'd like to weigh in on it, or maybe make a substitute ahead, motion. Uh, you like um, substitute motions? Yeah, <laughs> sometimes. Um, just my experience in, in a lot of years on the planning commission is that when people um, come in and ask for certain entitlements or ask for uh, extensions to their entitlements, like later hours and that sort of thing, it gives the city um, some kind of leverage to be able to scrutinize these things and condition them, which is what happened here. So as I read this and I read through eight pages worth of conditions by all the different departments that, that kind of scrutinize how they can do the thing that they do there and when and um, 
whatever. I mean, it, it seems like it's pretty tightly conditioned. So allowing them an extra entitlement also gives the city the benefit of adding a bunch of conditions into um, their operating agreement that we can go back and enforce after the fact too. So I actually like the thought of going along with it. I like what you said in terms of giving them a try. I would suggest uh, making a motion to approve it, but adding a condition that we necessarily bring it back for review. 90 days might be too soon, but maybe six months. Um, so I guess I'd like to make that a substitute motion to approve it, but add in a, a condition to to uh, bring it back for council review within six months. Um, let me know, city attorney, if I'm not phrasing this correctly. You would approve the zone change from C1 to C2. Oh. Uh, Okay. I see where you're going. And then the CUP, however, yeah, can be structured to come back in six months. So the six, the CUP. You're saying what's before us right now is just the zone change. That's, zone that's change. correct. Nothing, mm -hmm. nothing to do with the CUP. Why is that brought in a separate item? Why are we not seeing both of those packaged together? Why is the hours changing? Man? Well, from what I just understood is that this <coughs> CUP for the hours was approved by the Planning Commission. Contingent upon, however, the zone change going through. So, if I you do not approve the zone change, then the CUP is is not approved as well. Okay. Um, but I don't think the reverse is true. That if you approve the C the zone change, how they could address the CUP? Yeah. At that point, uh, the council would not be able to condition the CUP because the CUP is not before the council. If in fact the council were to be in favor perhaps of a different um, hours under the CUP, then my suggestion would be that n either no action be taken on the zone change tonight and the matter be basically referred back to the Planning Commission for their potential reconsideration of hours um, or to deny the the change and well, have it go back to the But I'm not commission. suggesting any change in the hours. I was just suggesting adding a condition of the CUP to bring but, it back for but review. But the planning commission would be the one who would have to do that. But not necessarily, right? I mean, all, we're, all I'm asking for is not to challenge what they did, but just to say, let's bring it back for review by the planning commission within six months. So you're saying that you would adopt the zone change and just direct that the planning commission look at this matter again in six months? Correct. Uh, they certainly could do that. The zone change would then be in effect, and the CUP would be in effect. And the burden, if there's a desire to change the CUP at that time, would rest with the city to show justification for a change in hours if that's desired at that time. But the staff could process that if that were desired. And, and any CUP is always subject to a call up if there's incidents. So in this case, we would do a six month analysis and determine if there's issues that would warrant going back to the Planning Commission for some type of action. Just suggesting since there's some uncertainty about this that we be a little more proactive about following up on it and um, taking a scrutinizing it again in six months to see how they're doing. Right. So if that's your substitute. Yeah. <laughs> Is that it? Is that your substitute motion? I'll second that. And I want to weigh in. I, I, I like this. Um, I think one of our speakers talked about individual application. That's what it is. For land use, I think um, I don't have a problem with that use at that location and those hours. The big question mark is the noise. What's the noise level going to be? So that's the uncertainty. So we'll know in six months, and that's the trial period that we have. I want to promote a business there at that location that uh, has some live entertainment. One of the speakers talked about that, and I'm, I'm supportive of that. So I think this could um, we could reach that, and if there's a noise problem down the road, we can settle it then or figure it out. And so that's why I support that particular substitute motion. Is it, is this a bar or is it a restaurant that serves alcoholic beverages? It's listed as a restaurant that serves alcoholic beverages. Do we have a, 
Uh, do we have written into it that they have to sell as much food as they do alcohol? Yeah, that's, that's one of the conditions that I just read is that sale of alcohol is incidental to sale of food, and alcoholic beverage sales cannot exceed 35% of the sales of food. There's a lot of things that are tightly structured at 35%. And how do you regulate Quarterly that? gross how, sales how do you regulate of, that? Yeah, that, well, it's, how do you identify it? That, that's why I'm asking that we follow up on it and sort of. I don't know that. I don't know if I'm doing follow up. You'd be able to tell if you can't tell now. And Mr. Mayor, just to let you know, it's when we change the zone to a C2 zone, then then a bar could be allowed. It would still be required to have a conditional use permit, but that, as the city attorney is telling you, the, act, the action before you is a zoning action. So it's not particularly related to this business. It's related to the land use. Do you want that property in perpetuity to have multiple types of uses uh, expand the zone over what the C1 allows? And it's opening it up so that it would allow bars or entertainment or uses that we traditionally keep further away from residential zones. I mean, you do have the right-of-way there, so you have some, you know, uh, barrier from residential as compared to the neighborhood to the north. That's a C1 zone. But, I mean, that's essentially the land use action before you. But if they wanted to become a bar, they would have to come back in and request. Yes. The, the can bar feet. on Euclid Street has a barrier. It's called Euclid Avenue, and the lady that complains about it is across the street with a ton of traffic running back and forth. And... Granted, there are no railroads running down that track anymore, but uh, I suppose that's possible. But uh, I think we're just making it into a bar uh, uh, without, I mean, how much food is going to be sold between 10 o'clock and 2 o'clock? I doubt there's very few groceries changing hands at that time of night. I, if you would, if you would lock in on on something, I can support the this substitute motion. I mean, I like to give everybody a chance, but uh, I support the substitute motion if uh, they uh, bring in their cash register receipts. Well, how do you determine? Go through. I'm not through yet. No, no. no. Well, I'm, go ahead. Finish your sentence. Thank you. Uh, their grocery receipts and let Kingsley go through it and see if they are. Meaning the, the the grocery goal on that. How do they determine they, that? They could do an like an audited financial statement. We have talked to businesses about this in the past when we've had problems where we thought they were serving. And I think we actually have had some businesses that we've asked to bring in those those kind so of. So all of them are required to have register tapes and for all sales and everything too. They're they're all required to keep that kind of information. So the, in the event that we wanted to audit it, we could see that they were in fact serving only uh, thirty five percent mm -hmm. alcohol. Okay. Okay, I guess we have a motion and a, a substitute motion and a second. Um, call for the vote. We're putting into it that we will take a look at the groceries and the versus the alcohol. Somebody over here. Is you know, I will still be here if I win or lose this election. <laughs> so... Uh, I would not be upset about putting it on the uh, men, uh, on the agenda for six months from now. Right now, that we will have Kingsley report on the report on it. And if you'll stick that in there, I will make a second. Oh, you did make a second. I will support the issue. So stuck. I'm going to call you guys on this. Motion received, three yes votes, with Mayor Dalton voting no. Okay. Six months from tonight. What's the next item? 5B. It's 5B. It's a public hearing to consider our annual performance and evaluation report having to do with our uh, federal funding, and Allison Mills is here to give a staff report in this item. Good evening, Mr. Mayor and Council Members. The item you have before you is the 2011-2012 Consolidated Annual Performance and Evaluation Report, also known as the CAPER. Federal law requires that all jurisdictions who receive Community Development Block Grant, Home Investment Partnership, and Emergency Service Grant funds assess the activities implemented during the program year and report accomplishments through the CAPER. During the program year, the City utilized its resources to expand and preserve affordable housing, fund public improvements, and assist seniors and those at risk of homelessness. 
Some of our notable accomplishments last year include home buyer loans made to 24 families. We assisted over 1,000 seniors with services and meal delivery. We provided homeless prevention and intervention services to over 2,000 people to avoid or recover from homelessness. We provided abatement of unsafe or unsanitary living conditions in 152 units. And we completed a splash, splash pad play apparatus and electrical upgrades at Garden Grove Park. The public review and comment period for the CAPER began on August 23rd and continues until the conclusion of the public hearing tonight. So far, no comments have been received. Last night, the CAPER was presented to the Neighborhood Improvement and Conservation Commission. The commissioners had no comments and recommended that the CAPER be transmitted to council. Tonight, you are asked to hold a public hearing to collect public comment, accept the report, and direct staff to submit the CAPER to HUD. This concludes my report, and I'm available to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you. Any questions for staff? Hearing none, I'll open a public hearing. Anyone here that would like to speak on this matter? Hearing none, I'll close the public hearing. No. I'll move we uh, accept it and send it to CAPER. Second that. A motion second. Call for the vote. Motion received. Five yes votes. Items for consideration. Mr. Mayor, uh, item 7A is an award of contract to No Best for uh, construction of a median on Lampson for the area west of Valley View, east to Knott Street. And Bill Murray is here to give a staff report on this item. Thank you, Mr. Fertel, Mr. Mayor, and members of the council. Tonight, council is being asked to award a contract to No Best Incorporated for the construction of a raised center median on Lampson from the west city limits to Knott. The current lamps and median is striped, and the adjacent parkways are bare dirt. For over a decade, staff has repe repeatedly applied for grant funding to improve this segment of lamps and, and provide the type of safety improvements seen in front of like Pacifica High School. Uh, the city was awarded a federal grant to construct the raised median, landscaping, and irrigation along this reach. Staff received seven qualified bids on August 6th, with no best being the lowest bid of just over $1.5 million. Should the council decide to award the construction contract tonight, no, no best can begin work in mid-November and should be, be complete by January of next year. It should be noted that this work will not use any general funds. This concludes staff's report. Thank you. Any questions for staff? I have a comment. Go ahead. Is this a, is this a public hearing? No? Um, no. I just want to commend staff on this work. I want to commend past uh, city councils for keeping this moving forward. I mean, this end of town with uh, Lampson uh, is my, end of the, uh, my neck of the woods, and it's going to be a vast improvement to that area. And it's, it's definitely needed, and, it, and thanks for your persistence for making it happen, too. It's taken money uh, or funding to get to this point, and we've achieved it. And um, I just I haven't been on the council that long, but I know one particular planning commissioner had a uh, desire to see this done, and so did I. And it's coming to fruition. I'm glad to see that. But um, I think the, the, the work that's been put into uh, making it come forward or having it come forward to the stage is uh, to be commended for the work on staff and the past councils for moving it forward. I thank you for that. Um, will there be temporary foreclosure? I mean, not foreclosure, closure of the streets? <laughs> yes, we'll have to work with the, con uh, the contractor on that. He, he's going to have to close uh, probably one lane at a time while he works on that median. Okay, that's good. That is the only setback, too, <laughs> having to it's worth it. break some eggs well, to make you know, it all yeah. you got to change. <laughs> I mean, if you want something, sometimes you have to give up a little bit, too. It. I move to approve. Let's second. have a motion and a second. Call for the vote. Motion received. Five yes votes. Ordinances presented for second reading. Mr. Mayor, you have ordinance number 2819 for second reading, the ordinance of the City Council of the City of Garden Grove adopting a negative declaration and approving amendment number A16912, a text amendment to subsection B4 of section 9360.3.4 of the Harbor Corridor Specific Plan to modify the limitation of the size of medical office uses within the retail shopping developments located in the district commercial zone of the Harbor Corridor specific plan area in order to increase the allowable size of such medical office uses 
to a maximum of 25% of the total building square footage of a retail shopping development, subject to the satisfaction of all applicable parking requirements. Move approval. Second that. I have a motion second. Call for the vote. Motion received four yes votes with Councilmember Broadwater voting no. Okay, matters. <laughs> Mr. Broadwater. Uh, I'd like to talk about uh, Clinton Street between uh, West Westminster and uh, Trask. Trask. Somebody from Public Works needs to take a look at that street. I mean, I felt like I was driving on Alameda Street down in Los Angeles. It's really bad. So it really needs, something needs to be done to it. Okay. Happy anniversary to Mayor Dalton and his wife, Sandy. How many years is this? Two. Two years? <laughs> I didn't think it would go that long. 51. 51? Yeah. Congratulations. Thank you. And still on their honeymoon. Huh. <laughs> uh, he didn't say no to that, so. I no, no, no. <laughs> no, I have no complaints. <laughs> okay. Well, happy um, anniversary Thank to you. the mayor and uh, Sandy. Um, I wanted to um, say a little bit about 9-11 and how it, Every year I remember it and where I was and what I was doing, like Council Member Jones said. It really saddens me each time to think back at that moment. But the one thing that, that I realized this morning as I was driving is that how important our police department and our fire department is. We never realized they are our first line of defense and our first lines of safety. And so I want to thank them for... Uh, doing a good job in Garden Grove so far, no complaints, and for also sacrificing within the last few years, and not many people know this, they have um, been in negotiation for um, benefits, and they have uh, cut back on their benefits, and they have forego um, raises because we're in a situation that um, the nation is suffering uh, with the economy, and we appreciate that very much. Uh, and it prevented us from having to lay off the people we really need um, to defend us and to protect us and to give us a quality of life. Uh, secondly, I want to thank um, the public work people for working on Dawson and Garden Grove. I saw the light going up, and pr I guess pretty soon we'll have very safe turns there. Uh, I have a comment regarding the um, intersection of... Um, Imperial, uh, Imperial and Benton Street. And if staff could look at the northwest corner, uh, they have lines of cars parked there every morning. And we, that's a, the street going to the school. And it's a blind spot. So maybe if we, I know it, it's hard to find parking now, but I think if we take a corner, um, one car space at that corner, um, line it red or, or whatever you need to do. I think that would be safer for people turning into Imperial from Benton because it, it's a street that's kind of curved, kind of funny. It doesn't go straight. It goes to the left and then straight up. So whoever needs to go straight, they have to move out a little bit before they see uh, what's on the left. And um, I've uh, seen, like, maybe three accidents within the last three years at that intersection. So um, it's not very costly correction, if we could look into that. Thank you. Mr. Jones. Happy anniversary to Mayor Dalton and Sandy. And I'd just like to um, kind of augment what uh, Council Member Wynn was saying about her appreciation for our um, public safety employees. Uh, you know, we've, we've always been a city that has learned to do more with less um, our population has grown exponentially, um, and our um, headcount in public safety has only grown uh, incrementally over that time. Um, so in times like these, especially with budget constraints and certain other things like um, AB 109, um, jail overcrowding and people being released from, um, from jails around Orange County, um, it's just a good time to say um, our 
uh, police department relies very heavily on um, the residents of the city to be an extension of the eyes and ears of the police to look out for things, watch out for each other. Great time to start a neighborhood watch, start a commercial watch in your business area, um, take advantage of some of the volunteer programs we have and just get involved. Um, nice to bridge that um, gap between the residents and our public safety officials so that there's a level of trust there and a, and a good open dialogue. Mr. Uh, Beard. Uh, happy anniversary to you and your wife. Thank you. And uh, I'd also like to mention that uh, September is National um, Disaster Preparedness Month. So people be prepared. And I want to welcome all the parents and the teachers and the students back to school. And just one program that's coming about through our police department is the National Drug Take Back Initiative, where you can give back drugs to the prescription drugs to um, the police department on September 29th. So it's a pretty good program. It's on the Internet. All this um, great information on our city's uh, web page. And I'd like to finish my comments with what we've been hearing a lot tonight and the, how sad and somber this day is, a uh, day of remembrance for uh, the victims. And our hearts and prayers still go out to the families and friends, the loved ones of the victims of, of this uh, horrible, horrible event. Um, and, uh, again, uh, our hearts and prayers go out to the, the true heroes of that day, the firefighters and the police officers who lost their lives. Uh, I just want to finish with the quote that I was reading today from our president. And he said, uh, quote, when the history books are written, the true legacy of 9-11 will not be one of fear or hate or division. It will be a safer world, a stronger nation, and a people more united than ever before, end of quote. So I just want to make those comments, and thank you all for remembering this special day. Um, everybody said something, uh, so I, I'm not going to. Um, because you, once you start talking about 9-11, you could talk for long, long periods of time. Um, I feel still feel heartfelt thanks for what the people did that prevented even the disasters that occurred. could have been a lot worse had not the people fought with... Uh, the hijackers, had they not steered the plane, they gave their lives to save uh, what is one of the most important things in our history, the White House. Um, if you've ever been in my office, I have a newspaper from New York City framed there, and it was after 9-11, and it shows the 343 firefighters. and lists them by name and has a photograph and everything of each one of them. Uh, and it, when you talk about it, it doesn't really hit the magnitude until you look at that and you think, and that's not... The civilians, the police officers, uh, a lot of the other volunteers or workers or whatever. That's just 343 people that were going into buildings when others were coming out. So I don't think I have to say let's never forget. I don't think anybody can forget or wants to forget. I want to uh, say happy anniversary to Sandy. And I have a list of grandkids I've forgotten, so I'm going to do it really quick. I want to wish happy birthday to my granddaughter Zoe and my four great grandsons, Mason, Akeem, William IV, and Kareem. And we'll adjourn the council meeting until Tuesday, September 25th, 5 30, in this building. Thank you.